have moved at a good rhythm. Este crecimiento, ¿no? Aquí lo he puesto un poquito en contexto, resaltando. Now I have put this into context, putting in blue the growth of Peru between 2001 and 2010, yearly annual growth. And they have been over the Latin American average by two, three percentage points. So this is not a Chinese rate, but it's not bad at all. So after that, Peru has grown at a rate that is above the rest. So this can be presented as a successful case. It is true that as Florencia mentioned yesterday, if we compare this with China, Vietnam, other Asian countries, the success would become relative. But in a way, in the Latin American group, the general growth of Peru has been greater. And if we see this in the long term, Peru had a terrible crisis in the 80s because of a very difficult armed conflict. In the 80s and 90s, the GDP dropped 25%. I don't think any other Latin American country can beat that record. And that was a consequence of that situation. And that is why I wanted to compare everything to the growth they had in 61, where they, Peru, had a more comparable growth rate to Latin Americans. And um, Peru seems to be uh, a part. There is a decrease in poverty, well, before the pandemic, with a bit of stagnation at the end. Of course, growth was very great until 2010, good until 2015. Not so bad until 2019, but clearly there is a decrease in growth after that. With a productive diversity that focuses on agro exporting, not too much productive complexity with high inequality and low distribution. Now, if we see the labor, the green portion, which is for low productivity, agricultural workers, uh, people who sell tamales on the street, that amounts to 70% of labor and employment. And that hasn't changed, essentially. The high productivity sector has increased a little bit, but not too much. I'm not going to go too much into detail with this, but you can see how there is a sector that is highly productive, but it gives 1% of employment. If we're optimistic, um, medium productivity sector, manufacturing, production services, and the agro informal sector, informal restaurants, that 70% does provide a lot of the employment in Peru. This is the big topic here. This is one of the big topics for us that we believe have an impact in Latin America. This is a low economic complexity country below Mexico and Colombia. I haven't found a better graph than this one, but uh, Gabriel Palma mentioned yesterday that the official measurement of inequality, the Gini, is this one over here. But the corrected one by different studies is this one in yellow. So while the measurement of the Gini coefficient shows a downward trend, the corrected inequality coefficient based on high income population is in yellow. And so data shows two different stories. So I agree with what Professor Palma mentioned yesterday. I think that one of the advantages of the work is 
for 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 us in research, it's uh, important to keep on studying these matters. So, how fair is wealth distribution in Peru? Well, eighty-five percent believes that it is very unfair. Peru is midway in Latin America. And if we keep on discussing inequality, this is mixed with uh, the fact that 25% of the population considering themselves as native in origin that have an inequality in terms of education, uh, mixed ethnicities and white people have better schooling levels than natives or Afro descendants. This image by a study done at ECLAC that is very revealing in my opinion, shows the inequality of the market as Professor Palma mentioned yesterday, inequality post government intervention. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to call this uh, color, but the blue purple is inequality after government intervention and Peru is this one over here. Yellow is how much the state redistributes and Peru is next to Bolivia and others. So we are quite an unequal market because of the market, but not so much, which is different from OECD countries or labels. For example, in, in Peru, we can see that there's no redistribution. There is a minimum negative, let's say. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll look for that. It's a study done by CLAC with people done in 2015, I believe. I'll, I'll send it to you. One of the reasons of this is that the Peruvian government has low tax income, 20%, but we can see that the average on Latin America, well, Peru is very low, but in OEC, the OCD is around 29 or 39 rather. In from 2000 to 2019, we see Latin America in the upper line. They did a, a great effort to reform their tax laws, and that made us increase uh, tax revenue. In the Peruvian case, we only saw an increase of 1%. I hope that this reflects many of the problems that exist in Latin America, a primary exporting economy with a good portion of labor in micro productivity jobs. As we mentioned yesterday, and in the particular Peruvian case, there is an ethnic inequality that marks pol politics and in a state that redistributes very little. These are the things that I would like to stress about Peru that characterize Peru and Peru being uh, an extreme case in Latin America. I hope it doesn't go too far from the Latin American examples. And I think it gets our attention as the case with the most growth, how can it have the least redistribution, very little changes in the productive matrix, high inequality. So it's like different products together don't necessarily hinder growth until 2017, of course. So we are now gonna talk about three concurrent crises. Um, as if we had received these three plagues, consecutive plagues that have impacted the country. Maybe the first 
although I, it was the last one that happened, was the pandemic. We had very low public debt before the pandemic, 25% debt. We can issue bonds. We have a bunch of international reserve. This is not an issue really. Our experts have grown grown 120 percent or or there are about 120 percent of our gdp and the result however was the highest mortality in the world in peru if we have an international ranking a ranking of all countries in the world and the country with the most mortality rate in the world among those countries over 1 million people in population. Now, this amount of people that died was brutal. So 300,000 300, dead in a country of 30 million. This is a huge amount. And this is one of the strengths, the public debt in Peru. You can see that in 2022, well, this is going to be lower, I think, but we are going to wrap up 2022 with 35% of debt. Uh, but before the pandemic, it was 28, far less than other countries in Latin America. We are doing okay in the capital market. 573% short-term foreign debt and yet so many debts. I'm gonna skip this because I'm, I'm gonna go here. Why so many debts? The first simple explanation. Well, the first explanation is because there is no investment in public health and in this chart, when the pandemic hit, if we compare the number of hospital beds by 1,000 uh, people, Peru is in the end. Peru uh, was in the end. And talking about hospital beds by 1,000 people was well below internet coverage. We are below a whole bunch of countries. Labor informality, we're very high. It is clear that a combination of poor health systems, difficulties to engage in telework and profiting from in the internet, informal jobs, leaves people without protection and that forced a lot of Peruvians to work in unsanitary ways. People were doing, why are, why are you out in the street? People were asked, it's banned. And people asked, said, I can either die from hunger I, or I can die from COVID. So I'm going to go and try to make some money to buy food. This is a big issue, right? It's a Peruvian problem, but I think that it repeats itself in different sizes in different Latin American countries. COVID in Peru and the main problem I'm going to be aiming at that I think that needs to be addressed in our discussion is government. People ask, they have had so many governments. And the fact is that in 2017, the Odebrecht papers came out and four former presidents are now involved. Toledo was in prison or is in prison in the US. Alan Garcia committed suicide. Ollanta Humala was in prison. And then last elected president is now under house arrest pending trial. So 
with Odebrecht, the main construction group that was very important was also involved. And now they have changed their name and they're trying to sell the company. And this week they have tried to reach an agreement to pay $400 million in taxes or something like that. And in Peru, politics have been uh, led by Keiko Fujimori, uh, the daughter of President Fujimori, who is in prison. And Keiko Fujimori received $3 million in 17 briefcases in cash that she took home by the owner of the main Peruvian bank. So this is quite unheard of. So this, together with the previous thing, have le led to the situation in Peru in 2014, 15, 16, seemed like a successful case, but Kuczynski was elected, he fell, then v Vice President Vizcarra took office, then Congress was closed, and then there were new elections and the new president with the whole series of complications with the Congress uh, against him uh, wanted to quit and until 2016 where Kuczynski was elected, it seemed like Peru had a stable democracy, right? We didn't think that a president could be ousted. We couldn't imagine that presidents lasted five years and we criticized them. We called them corrupt. People always did that, but governments lasted five years, but no more. That is not the case anymore. And I put this as a framework for Peru because I see many signs of this in Latin America. And I have seen this for many years. Chile has had massive protests. The new government wins. They change the constitution. Then Bolivia with the uh, Yanez coup d'etat in Ecuador, they have these disputed elections and massive protests by indigenous people just a few months ago, Argentina, the dollar is through the roof, uh, an attempted murder against Cristina, and it may be possible to have another pendulum swing by at Brazil. Well, this was written before the elections, but Bolsonaro is a risk. It seems like he's not going to be anymore, but the government is going to be stuck because of the conditions of the Congress. So I see this and I believe and what one might think about developing policies in, our, in Latin America and financing and change, but maybe the first thing we should answer is who's going to do that? when our governments, many of our governments are so unstable. I haven't included Colombia, but of course the years will let us know. Mexico is a particular case. I mean, I would like to focus on this big topic. There is no development, there is no development policy without a government with minimal stability. There are different cases, Argentina, Ecuador, and maybe even Brazil with Lula that is coming back. But of course, one comes and they do something, they get out. Another one comes and they break down what was done before. We might think that Economic development may require a horizon 10, 20 years to settle. And this is not happening in Latin America. So if the problem are the governments, and if in Latin, many Latin American countries, we finish this period with all these governability and governance problems with a uh, instability here and a coup d'etat over there in different manifestations, 
it seems very different from Vietnam, Taiwan, China, India, where we see a certain higher stability if we are compared with Southeast Asia. Of course, we are peculiar. They haven't had dictatorships over there. And while we did have certain dictatorships during our development, there was also a notion of stability. So being aware that the political governability topic is complex, I mean, I don't wanna say that the policy is determined by economy. Those of us who discuss economic development should pay more attention to how policies and government policies have an impact on that. These uh, Latino barometers, Latino barometers uh, in Latin America are a bit extreme. 85% believe that the government was democratically elected, does not benefit the whole world, but only the powerful groups. 85% of people believe that access to education, justice, and health is unfair. And the base, I believe in Peru, and many Latin American countries, we, we should nuance this, but the base is lack of equality in terms of income. There is a high wealth concentration. And I think that Gabriel Palma's presentation, they, 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 he talked about the richest 10%, but I think that the studies that aim their attention at the richest 1% are more interesting. We are, have millionaire presidents in Latin America, many of them. There is an oligarchy, a sector of concentrated economic power that is very resistant, very protective of its privileges, not very competitive, not very nationalistic, and racism, of course. That depends on the countries, but in Peru and in Brazil and Mexico and in many other countries, this is also important. And while the pandemic in many of our countries and in Peru, the situation was increased. If the government is useless to defend my life and if I'm sick and I need oxygen, the result is gonna be negative. So people, are disattached from the government. They don't love the government. They don't want the government, whoever the ruler is. So I would like to set three theories about the relationship between the economy and the state weakness. I think that th the economy impacts in three ways. The stability and the duration of a government. First, most people have to survive selling, for example, tamales on the street. But if many people have to sell tamales on the street, one does that because one doesn't have a better job. But if you do that, you are outside of the law. Of course, you're not illegal, but you're not a taxpayer, you're not contributing, you don't have a permit, right? You're in the fringes. And also on top of this, we reinforce this ideology that the result depends on yourself. How do people get through? By their own bootstraps, right? Pulling by their own bootstraps. I don't want the government bothering me. I don't care about big policies or big economy. No. Some people might think that what is important is how the whole works, but in this situation, we don't care about the state. And when the state wants to collect taxes, why would I pay? Because I don't want services or they if they don't give me services or if they give me services that don't work. So productive structure, the productive structure sustains informality and 
people are on the fringes of the state. This has been debated, but I think that it does create weakness in the state. In moments of crisis, I believe that these sectors are very resistant. They defend their space, let's say. They defend their small little place where they can produce. And without a doubt, there are things like Uber, for example, that tend to potentiate this phenomenon. You're not, you're no longer a registered taxi that is paying taxes. You are an individual that doesn't want the police to regulate him or her who wants to work on their own, period. And that takes away the ability from the state to rule and to impose policies. The second topic is obvious in my opinion, public financing. Of course, with low tax pressure, there can't be a state without resources. If tax revenue is very low, well, what are going to be the big policies that they'll be able to do? The policies will always be impacted by the tax and fiscal narrowness. And of course, this impacts the infrastructure efforts that can be done. And I think that informality and these big sector of micro producers will unlikely give back. But in a mining country, uh, there should be easier to collect taxes. But the administrative part can be easier, but the policies uh, are impacted by labor and it's very difficult for a state to be legitimate and to fulfill its role if it doesn't have resources. This is quite direct in my opinion. That is why all these discussion about tax reforms and the proposal in Chile, in Colombia, uh, I believe that it was also discussed in Ecuador. I think that that has an importance in the long term. And the third knot or bottleneck, as I coined it, is inequality. Inequality is born from the productive structure when we have a bunch of people, uh, for example, the Tamale salespeople. They survive day by day with very low income. And there is a concentration of wealth in big companies. And this generates a de detachment of society from the state. There are many reasons not to pay taxes. And a small and medium enterprise owner are also found in this uh, position, why would they pay taxes? Of course, every citizen should contribute, but if I give money and I don't get anything, or if I get money and then they steal it and they don't collect taxes from people who earned millions of dollars. So collectively, there is a resistance to paying taxes. In my opinion, I think that that has different problems or this creates different problems, political problems, this detachment from people, the poorest people, those affected by inequality, and they don't have, because of this inequality, any backing in terms of health, they don't have roads, education. So they don't support the state, nor they respect the state very much. It's okay if they give you something, the state, but one shouldn't contribute too much. So there is this lack of reasoning uh, between, in the relationship between the state and the population. This is the essential. I believe that this is the main knot that I wanted to underline. 
I was thinking about this notion of economic development, and I know that we don't usually talk a lot about the strength or the importance of governments. It might sound more related to political science, but in Latin America, we are stuck in this problem. We want a developmentalistic state. We want a state that gives us a lot, but our state is just useless and it's corrupt. It's not backed by the population. It has no tax revenue capability. So there's uh, the entity that we consider as key to apply development List policy seems to be part of the problem, not just public policies that we can impose tariffs, exchange rates, we can all these cause that. But I think that government is also under discussion. And I would like to finish with two little topics. The first refers to the discussion started by Professor Palma yesterday, what is more important, redistribution or productive diversification? Professor Palma mentioned that if we only have income to redistribute to people, how are we going to grow in the long term? Only with productive diversification. I understand this argument, right? It's understandable. I see that there are arguments in that in its favor, but we also, on the other hand, need human capital, and this framework of social security and health that gives legitimacy to the state. I see, I think that this is a big complex topic and I see that this is complex because a big part of productive development relates more to policies than state funds. I mean, people always say we should aim at higher tariffs and that wouldn't impact contribution. That would be a policy. Maybe these things can be done at the same time. Some trends say that we should collect, we should collect taxes, high taxes to a big industrial producers. Maybe that's a way to hinder the Dutch disease and, and these topics, I think that we combine them. And this uh, other topic that I'm interested in is health and development. This is a topic that is under discussed. All of a sudden we had this pandemic and we said, hey, we kind of forgot about health. And two years later, we are quickly forgetting about health again. I think that there is a series of elements here that we can pick up. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but there is one more topic to add. There are many things in the many topics in my presentation, but health, we can't forget about health again. Here we have connections, but also peculiarities. We can do a lot of things here in this topic, regardless of all the other things. So this was basically what I wanted to show you. And I would like to finish with this. If the state is the key, I saw this for Peru, but it applies to other countries. We require a government strategy. The government needs to see where it wants to go. And there's not any. We need a minimum political consensus. And I'm doubtful about this because there's a lot of political concentration now. If we're going from one side of the pendulum to the other, and if the next administration is going to tear everything down, it, we're going to have issues. We need government stability. In Peru, it's very low. We need citizens backing the state. This is another thing. This is the way a state works. They need to have planning, alternative thinking, and a good communication policy. Maybe here, I'm thinking about how, when we talk about developmentalistic policies, we usually think about economic policies, 
etc. But we need a state with certain basic conditions, I would say. And I think that we need to think about the components a little bit more, how we build a state that is able to have the conditions to think, not to think, to apply developmentalistic policies. And well, that's all. Thank you very much. I'm open to the discussion. Okay, so we can now open the floor to comments. Pablo, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I apologize for not being able to be there in person. I followed Pedro's presentation. I asked for his slides in anticipation, and I wanted to stress a couple of points that emphasize several sides and aspects of his presentation. There is a factor that I think it's important to stress and underline uh, something positive for the Peruvian economy in terms of its evolution since the 2000s. And I say this with huge envy as an Argentinian due to the indicator that Peru had since the 2000s on, which is uh, the, the ratio of credits and deposits in dollars. In 2000, it was around 85%. So 85% of all credits and deposits were in dollars and that number decreased to less than 30 in 20 years which is a success and i say this with a huge amount of envy as an argentinian in that sense i think that the financial aspect not just that inflation but financial, and it's related to the other two, ha has been better. The other part that Pedro mentions, again, the data cannot be refuted. Peru, or rather the impact of the pandemic in all Latin America stripped the vulnerability from their makeup and it made them evident for better or for worse and again with a huge amount of envy because of the de-dollarization of peru uh, the data shows that those who got out of the pandemic better. Of course, there was a huge amount of debt, but the at least the health system was never saturated, as we saw in other areas and in Europe even. This shows something that relates to how the state's abilities are built. It takes time to build them. They have certain resilience, but it's not infinite. The Argentinian case reaffirms that this is not infinite. And so we have the challenge of how to generate these abilities and both for development and redistribution. I agree fully that we need a tax reform that Colombia seems to be aiming at in a more eloquent way. I think that a tax reform is very important. I think that in the region, there are not in Argentina, 
not in Brazil, not in, in Mexico, but in many other countries, there is a certain re ideological resistance to involving the government in industrial roles. And I think that that could be a good way to try to build those abilities at the same time as we move forward with redistribution and productive development. I am not an expert at all. Uh, uh, and I may be even saying completely dumb things, but I believe that the development of public industries in strategic sectors is one of the potential ways to explore because they are in that narrow intermediate place. Uh, how can I say this? Uh, they are between a full nationalization and also rent capture and also non-intervention and non-regulation of private companies. So I think that the path for public industries in strategic sectors it may be interesting brazilian the brazilian case is interesting petrobras has been a developer of the brazilian oil sector that has grown importantly in the recent decades and now they want to privatize it but in Argentina, we have other examples in Bolivia, Mexico, Pemex. I think that that is a way. And why not involve the mining sector in this case? I also think that I also think that the development of national companies can also contribute to the financial sector. Uh, precisely financing or rather involving the sector by creating interest in the development of these companies. Why am I talking about this? Because Pedro mentioned, and I think that this is paramount in this new wave of progressive governments that hopefully will continue with Lula. Uh, the context that we have is usually opposed to the one that we had in the 2000s. In the 2000s, after the end of the 90s, at the beginning of the 2000s, Lula the Kirchners, they came about in a context, the phrase would be in a context of lack of interest by the United States in the region. They came about in a context of high commodity prices, a weakness, structural weakness of the political forces that preceded them, forces that, let's say, were neoliberal. So there was a relative weakness. Lula was conditioned, but still, I mean, that's not the situation nowadays. The U.S is not ignoring the region, even if we're not the main focus of its interest, but there is more focus on China and, and the right-wing 
forces control parliaments. This is a case in, in which we find ourselves uh, progressive forces in almost all Latin America are in government with parliaments that are against them. The third aspect is the international financial sector that is opposed to the one that we had before, high interest rates that, well, there are many countries in Latin America who don't really have debt problems, but it does make it difficult to access new financing. So the international context is very complicated, radically opposed, and I think that we need to moderate the expectations of what we can do. I think that the deception will be even higher. And the reaction will be even be stronger. So the international contact in, in, is important. The development of capabilities is difficult, of public capabilities is difficult without any reactionary quorums and moving forward with uh, tax reform is also difficult, not just because of everything related to resources, but because of inequality. A tax reform that stimulates investment with uh, carrots and sticks, I think that this is very difficult, but in last in the last instance is what captures the most what we are discussing which is political economy the political economy of state infrastructures and redistribution and the political economy of productive development how to balance these forces this is a challenge that we shouldn't how to say i'm a bit cynical about this and i don't think that we shouldn't have too many expectations about it those are my comments about this thing thank you again for the invitation and for the presentation Thank you very much, Pablo. Are we going to have a round of questions or not? Let's see. Oscar Ugarteche has raised his hand. Okay, let me react quickly to what Pablo mentioned to move on. Okay, first of all, uh, the de-dollarization comment was very interesting. Indeed, there was a strategy in, put in place by the Peruvian Central Bank that, that was interesting. And people thought that Menem, Menem's policy was good and they wanted to replicate this in Peru. And this has been quite effective and it combines more regulations in banking for credit in dollars. So that is the policy that has been effective for de-dollarize the economy. Your other big comment is what you, what you mentioned about building capabilities and public companies could be a way. Indeed, this is an interesting discussion, let's say, because in a way, in a way we can fight the Dutch 
disease with state intervention. And I think that in the sector of strategic uh, companies or extractive companies, Petrobras in Brazil, PDSA, uh, uh, Pemex in Mexico, that each could be analyzed in their own reality because they have their own political economy themselves this sector that generates so many profits and earnings to a state, then the relationship with those companies and the state is uh, peculiar. Also, the importance about the development banks as public entities who have an important role in supporting finances, right, as a leverage to productive development, and we usually have these public banks, these public financing tools. I think that that could be in combination with other policies for public companies in other countries. Lithium is being discussed, and what is the best way to profit from that national wealth? Could uh, foreign companies simply exploit it and give us royalties or if if it's necessary to industrialize everything and nationalize everything i if we think about a country creating a company to manufacture lithium batteries that would be difficult and lastly another comment about the international context the international context is very negative in the short term. And that is why I think it's a high risk for elected progressive governments. What, but one can't stop thinking about a possible opportunity that that might include. This whole discussion about international value change, they have created problems for country, countries, but it has opened a space to the Peruvian economy because the context of international prices have favored Peru. And Pereira said, we shouldn't have international financing because it's not good for us. But as you said, this is something that is out of our control. This is not a political topic. He formulates this as a explicit policy. It doesn't matter if we want it or not. It's simply can can't be avoided that makes me think a little bit about the 30s and 40s of the previous century where a big portion of latin america started industrialization because of international conditions or supported by international conditions and i think that this is something that we can analyze a bit more but i'm gonna leave it at that and let's go to the questions in the room Oscar has also wrote down a question. Uh, we're gonna hear from the questions in the room first, Oscar, if you could wait a moment. Thank you very much. I, I again have to go back to the strange charm of the bourgeoisie, this film, I would like to ask, is it possible to have economic development a la Korea way <clears throat> without any consequences. I mean, there was a correlation of strengths in states that sometimes were, were not democratic to industrialize in other cases. But let's go back to Peru. You have a uh, desirable economic growth, 5%, while well, you also have a growth of the financial sector that is remarkable. Now I understand that the surplus of that economic development ended up in the financial sector and that there wasn't a consumption of that surplus. And that is how you can continue to grow what what sh should be done we know that 
SMEs may be our strengths. And I wonder what to do with strategic sectors, lithium and others. I don't know, in the case of copper, in the Peruvian case, people also talk a lot about people not paying taxes. Do you know how a very basic tax policy started here in Mexico by asking people to pay what they owe? I agree that we, we need to industrialize and we need to industrialize from what is simple to what is complex. And we shouldn't replace big imports. For example, the auto industry in Mexico to then address the little things. No, Latin America hasn't had throughout its history a sector of that produces mid income. We should start thinking differently. Thank you, Pedro, for your presentation. It makes us think about many things. I would like to ask three little simple questions to complete the background about Peru. Do you know, uh, you mentioned that tax revenue is very low. What are the main taxes that are collected? And the second question, the growth that I imagine is for exports. What is the main engine for that growth in Peru that you showed us? And the third question about data is about the fiscal result. I imagine that there should be a fiscal surplus or was the situation those are my three main questions that i would like to have to complete the background information that you gave us on peru and everything is bi-directional we have a weak state because of underdeveloped economy and vice versa but we need to start with something as pablo mentioned capabilities are built and i was thinking about 2001 with so many presidents that lasted nothing and then Ernesto Kirchner with low support and the motto was let them all leave yet that capability and that support was built so you also mentioned that the financial part is macro stable so we shouldn't go first with a tax reform but rather an expansion of the public expenditure financed by that so my question was what do you think about what should be the first step today in peru to build that capability where would you start what are the two or three axes that you see as possible. Thank you, Pedro, for your presentation. I think it's very important to include the political topic, and I think it's important to define what type of state will require. I think that countries tend to fall into what I call hyper-presidentialism in economic theory, this is maybe too easy, but it it can have certain risks. I think that this discussion in economic terms is very important, and we sometimes uh, forget about it because it's not economic. I would also like to ask about the weight that private pension systems have in Peru. 
that I think it can also explain part of the distribution problems that they have and what Noemi mentioned a moment ago about how important the financial system is. And finally, I would like to uh, add a comment that I thought it was crazy that could explain the amount of deaths that they have during the pandemic, despite the fact that they have these control cyclical strategy in Peru, there were people who didn't have a basic asset or a fridge where to store uh, goods, and that's why a lot of people died. So just as your the title of your presentation says, mirror or mirage, there are many contradictions. It seems like we're still living in the past century, don't you think? Thank you. Oscar, if you can just hang on a minute. Right, big questions, right? About Korea, reindustrializing pact versus redistribution. I focus on salary. I also believe that China has bet on having low salaries uh, to have a competitive factor. And when people see that there is rapid growth, the expectation of improvement surpasses redistribution efforts by the government. But I don't know what the political implications of that would be. I mean, there are particular conditions. I don't know if in Latin America we are at that moment either. I don't think that that is a bad idea, but again, the political issue is more important. I think that the creation of a financial internal system is due to increasing the amount of money and investment. And in this period, there was interesting growth related to credit to SMEs, micro enterprises, microfinancing, that has grown a lot. It was almost zero in the 2000s, but now it's quite relevant. And during the pandemic, one of the things that worked quite well was that the Ministry of Economy engaged in a credit program, 60 billion soles. This was very strong in Peru and it reached many micro companies, small companies, and some of them even informal. So they were giving credits to informal businesses. So this is interesting. How much it helps, we don't know, but lithium, yes. I tend to think that a mixture of a state company with an international agreement mixture could be beneficial. Um, of course, the lithium in Peru is different from the Bolivian and Ecuadorian lithiums because of the deposits and pay what you owe is a good beginning. But in Peru, this is complicated because the constitutional tribunal has issued decisions to certain companies for them to not pay what they owe. If it's a big company and if they don't pay taxes, they have this advantage. The trial is gonna end in 10 years and you're gonna pay, but you save the interest during those 10 years. So you can pay now or not pay, also pay your attorney and then end up paying less. Right. and a small comment about the capital and asset sector. In Chile, there's a bit more, and in Peru, we have much less, but some do mining machinery. I went a few months to check some out, and I was astonished. There is no capital asset market, but there are a few companies that have built drilling, machinery that they sell around the world and it's interesting 
it's very little peru is not very industrial is not it doesn't have a lot of industrial complexity but they have these things that can get our attention and taxes the main taxes collected in the in peru is the value value added tax and the mining tax which is cyclical if the price of copper is high as was the case last year then 2.5 percent of gdp additional uh, 2.5 percent of gdp entered uh, but then it might drop and we also have income tax there is no uh, ownership tax or property tax and tariffs are almost zero the the average of tariffs in peru is two percent i think so it's very very low and the fact the, or the reason why Peru has debt is because they have maintained expenditure quite restricted when the fiscal income has been reduced. The government has also reduced expenditure in a contraction. And they, when the prices have gone up for copper, they have also used this as a as a piggy bank. So the debt is low, but also the state has its own assets. And I believe it's 14% of the GDP. That is why during the pandemic, the state didn't have any issue by spending 9% of GDP because they had the money. How to compensate the capabilities or how to start building the capabilities of the state. One possibility is the tax reform in Peru. We might wonder if we have so very little debt and health is so badly managed, that would create issues with a public debt that amounts to 30 percent of the gdp while in other countries it's almost double and your financing is cheap that is an option without a doubt to try to get social backing from the society to the state and what atiuska mentioned I'm going to start with the easiest thing, and then I'm going to go with the most difficult thing. AFPs, oh, pension funds, they, in Peru, they have worked for 30 years, and they have amassed an amount of assets that I think it's 30% of GDP. But because of a political issue, there's a lot of lobbying, and they have a lot of political strength. But in... 2015, at the end of one of the administrations, they lost a battle at Congress. And the system now is the system. I mean, I am forced to contribute to the system uh, uh, until I'm 65. But at 65, I also get um, my pension. Uh, People usually handle money with prudence and uh, they, in, in the pandemic, several times we have allowed people to withdraw money from these pensions and the internal consumption has been maintained because of that. That doesn't resolve the issue of inequality because the poorest people don't have a pension plan or they have a very little one and the ones who don't have a fridge they usually don't have a pension plan so that doesn't resolve the issue of inequality that is in labor and lastly the most complicating thing in your question is the hyper presidentialism i think that in latin america we've had 
hyper presidentialisms, but as someone mentioned, Pablo, I think what we have now are presidencies. I don't know uh, how to say it with opposing Congresses with very limited power in Chile, Colombia, and Peru. I believe this is going to be the case of Brazil. And I think that that alternative, I fear, hopefully it, it won't be, but I fear that that is going to give us stuck governments picked by the left, but who simply can't uh, rule because the laws, when you want to do a reform in our countries, you need the support of the Congress and the Congress is going to say no. So you have a leftist or progressive executive with a Congress that won't allow reforms because they don't want them on the one hand and on the other. It's good for them to ha have the president not comply or not fulfill his or her promises. So I think that we're going to end up in a being stuck. And also with the resurgence of an ultra right in some of our countries that is ultra aggressive. I think that we need to analyze this um, situation. It's a bit complex. And what is the formula to reconfigure the state? Um, I don't know. I think that we need to have a whole discussion of the current democracies and what we're supporting and what citizen decisions end up being. I think that there are reasons to be critical and rethink of one of the patterns that we have grown used to accepting the prevalence of the central bank and certain autonomous agencies. Well, I think that we need to rethink the whole configuration of the state government. I'm not a political scientist, but I, we could do that. And in any case, it impacts economic development. Part of the Latin American governments usually have a central bank. And I'm not all, but I think that most. And so they follow the logic of an expansive policy, but they're going to be centrist. And I mean, the executive is progressive, but the central bank is rather conservative with a, an opposing Congress. Of course, the margin in political economy is stagnation. I see this as stuck. Oscar, go ahead. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. It was very uh, complete. Adding the government, the problem of the government to economic analysis, I thought it was very useful. And having had five presidents, has to be a factor, an important factor for several things. I believe that Peruvian conservatorism has be, has grown, and but also there is fear to not change anything. There is social panic. against the moving things in non-traditional ways. There's a lot of uncertainty. Now, what I have been doing is, well, for a presentation next week, I've studied what has happened with the distribution of income in the world and what has happened with the distribution of climate problems in the world. And using Piketty's data is that Let's see, the distribution of, in of income amongst countries, it improved. There is less gap between the richest and poorest countries, and also they changed in comparison to 20 years ago. And now also among in, well, within each country, the ceiling of the richest people went up and the floor of the poorest also increased, but because the ceiling moved up more than the floor, the this inequality 
within each economy grew. So there's no, there's not more poverty than 20 years ago, but in relationship, in, in relation to the rich, there is a farther distance. And this in the current situation is complicated by several reasons. We have the recession of the world that is coming. 0.5% growth in the US and very low growth in Europe and China because of energy issues that is coming. The other thing is that we have a financial subordination that is noteworthy because of interest rates. When the Fed increases its interest rate because we have these open markets on regulated markets, if we all not increase their interest rates, the exchange rates of the peripheral economies will be depreciated. Europe underestimated its subordination level. They thought they were more autonomous than they are. They didn't adjust their interest rate and the Euro fell 23%. So we have a recession, a world recession problem on the one hand, and on the other hand, we are importing a recession and we are importing this recession with increases in interest rates. So the question is, what do you think of the distribution from one place to the other? What efforts can be done? Because it may seem like we're not at the moment where we can do contrastive uh, policies be because there is going to be an external recession. So th that's my question. What do you think about the topic of distribution? Thank you, Oscar. I would start with the national response to then go to the international response. The first response is, I think that the recession contexts are difficult. They make national redistribution efforts more difficult. On the one hand, the poor people are more impacted by when you're growing six, seven, eight percent, when you have more money, you distribute the margin, right? Okay, mining company, you were earning $5 billion a year. Now you earn $10 billion. Of that surplus, you should re redistribute half. If you're earning more than before, okay, it's easier to accept. You're not earning 10 billion, but you used to earn 5 billion. So you're gonna end up with 7.5 billion. But of course the mining company saying that collections are going down and they're saying that they are now going to have $3 billion in earning. And if the government wants to take away 1 billion more, of course the re rejection is going to be dire. This is human behavior. It's usually the case. I think that recessions make redistribution efforts more difficult in countries. And also there's less room where to get money from or resources to redistribute. So I think that this is a big topic for national efforts. That is why I'm not really surprised by the fact that Colombia Ocampo took out gold and copper away from their tax reform, or maybe there was a partial elimination of, of these sectors. This of course calls for negotiations, but also the context pushes to that direction. So now, on the other hand, as you say, there is a worldwide recession context that 
it's difficult to escape from, it seems. We have a worldwide integrated financial system. And I don't think that Europe or England can say, forget about the interest rates, I'm going to maintain mine. That is clear. Uh, I think that Latin American central banks have this dilemma. I can either increase the rate or depreciate my currency. Sometimes I wonder with the reserves that the Peruvian, the Peruvian bank has, maybe they could do a bigger effort if we have this amount of reserves. When is the time to use them? They are called reserves for, for one reason. So I don't know. I think that the magnitude of international flows and the integration of financial markets make it difficult to oppose this recessive worldwide wave. And on the one hand, it is clear that the interest rate is going to cause a redistribution to renters, the owners of bonds, bondholders, the future bondholders uh, versus productive companies. Of course, productive companies are going to reduce their earnings. How do labor markets work? Well, this is a topic that is still under discussion, even in the American market. It is not as obvious, and you know that there is an open discussion in the American market about whether it's possible to control inflation without a very high impact on unemployment. I don't know if you saw that Paul Krugman tweeted something a few days ago saying that in the last labor reports in the US made him think that there may be a reduction of job vacancies versus unemployment. I think that there's still a, an open discussion about how Latin American job markets adjust. I think that the post pandemic uh, creates a particular situation also in that regard. So, and I would also add, talking about the worldwide redistribution efforts, I think that the main impact of the pandemic worldwide has been, uh, it has pushed technologies, IT technologies, communication technologies forward, and it has given a lot of value to the five big ones, uh, American uh, companies that you know who have a, value in the trillions. I think they have surpassed three trillions. And of course, the pandemic has led to them growing a lot. I don't know what, how much Zoom is worth, but I would bet that Zoom not being a big company, uh, yet they started as a small company in the pandemic. And that continues to uh, a mass value in these big companies. Now they're going through a drop, right? You know, technology shares in NASDAQ are very sensitive. They have a high sensitive. They're more speculative, these shares. But I would say that these are the temporary F effect. I think that in the long term, they will gain back their position. And even in the new worldwide geopolitics, the U.S. clearly will be reinforced and its companies are going to be earning a lot. So let's say that the conflict between these telecommunication companies and Huawei uh, is much more aligned with the current worldwide geopolitics that has a lot of more confrontation between East and West. I think that these companies will continue to have big economic development and growth. 
and about the worldwide distribution of income. Uh, while China has stopped its growth, the other country that is highly important that is, is India. You know that India has as many people as China. It's poorer than China, but it has grown in a rate that is actually higher than China's for the past two, three years, and is not as stagnant nowadays. And India is like China. India is moving the world in terms of the distribution of income. I think that the worldwide redistribution of income should focus on what is happening in India. China has stopped. India, of course, in term is less than terms of in terms of GDP. Uh, the poor populations in India are higher than in China, so they will have to focus on raising the floor of those who are on the bottom first. There are two additional questions here. Based on what you mentioned, Pedro, and I thank you so much for your conference and your response about presidentialism, you insisted a lot on the stability of the government. There's no development without government stability. But I wonder, government stability, for them to at least finish their four, five, or six years, right? Or stability of the economic system because with neoliberal democracy and elections, the risk of these changes is higher, or are we going to ban elections? I mean, you don't specify what you mean with stability because many sociologists, and I apologize if there are any sociologists in the room, but they, even justified dictatorships because that gave stability and it allowed the accumulation of assets. That is right-wing governments that didn't concede it to social pressure. So I would like for you to clarify that because we are addressing policy without being so political sciences. I think it, we should clarify that. And about SMEs, because of the duality that we have in the Mexican, Mexican uh, production diversity, which is the one that I know, very little companies have enough production and added value and 98% of industrial establishments are informal or they have very low quality. So do we maintain that or do we do something like in Korea and Japan where the big ones don't have as much and the medium and small ones are very competitive and high technology companies that can establish uh, vendorship links amongst themselves. I think that in Peru, you should have something similar based on the data that you shared about concentration on informal jobs. This is a question by Leonardo Montoya. What is the impact that Mercosur has nowadays? What is the mission? What is the mission that Mercosur has nowadays? Thank you very much, Pedro. Excellent presentation. I think that we're talking about things that evolve, but I think that much of what Gabriel Palma presented, if we mix it with your presentation, it would be great, not just his presentation, but all rather. But I'm thinking, let's say, all these thing about where we're going, how is that gonna be financed? You hit the target by saying that there is indeed an important 
political issue, continuity, and how we can have continuity. And you also mentioned an important topic about, and I'm, I'm especially when we talk about lithium in Mexico, we recently had this discussion about nationalizing this or creating a state-owned company. And I understand from your presentation that it is needed, but is it a government or rather a political problem? And also how is that linked with private initiatives or private companies? What do you see, what do you think that relationship could be? I think it could be very complex. Yes, we need it, but how can we establish it in such a way that we don't lose control? What is the tilting point? I was hearing about the experience recently of electricity in Uruguay based in private companies. And I think it was good. There was control by the state of the strategic sector that if it fails, it will create a lot of problems. But how to control that relationship between two stakeholders that are needed with political conflicts, lack of continuity, but that needs to exist and it's going to be paramount. Thank you. What Alicia mentioned, I think that Peru is similar indeed. And I showed this in a chart actually. There's a small sector and in Peru, they they employ 20% of the population, mining, big industry, big companies, and 8% going to the state and 70%, which are micro companies, self-employment with the same problems as most, low productivity, etc. And indeed, this is a topic, this is a big, uh, difficult topic. And of course, the question is strategies, and we haven't discussed this. The experience in the Southeast Asia region is industrialist. Some studies by Rodrigo, et cetera, uh, point to the fact that in the industry, industrialization with employment is now industry moving forward, but without creating more employment. So the in, industrial GDP increases, but not employment or in industry or industrial employment. So I think that we need to look for the biggest takeoff of industry in our country, but uh, repeating uh, an experience like the Chinese or Korean, I don't think that's viable. We can bet on a 40 year strategy like in South Korea, but it won't happen. Um, because of the situation of the worldwide economy, because there are very strong competitive competitors because of the technological change, that strategy would be very difficult. I think that we need to start a more diversified effort where we use our natural resources a bit more, where the possibility of new technologies imply uh, the creation of innovative things that are placed in the worldwide market, telework, we should think of other options in a more diverse way. Even the topic of worldwide consumption uh, leans more towards symbolic services than materials. We, our countries have a cultural wealth that could be well positioned around the world, but it does require a strategy, a productive development strategy, similar to the industrial one. I mean, Palma also mentioned industry and services. We should think about that. And the issue of micro companies and small companies have two options, co cooperation, cooperativism, that works in certain countries, in agricultural sectors, it works in certain areas, 
in Peru, maybe. And the other option is this articulation contracts relationship between big company and small company. But that, of course, implies being a company not of one employees, uh, maybe a technological company, more people with a lot of technology, very well connected small company. You might have heard about the experience with textile companies in Italy, that it's quite old. I think that we need to start thinking about these sort of things. The state has a role in that partnership because that is facilitated with financing and government participation. The very partnership is thanks to all these parties coming together. And in Peru, we have this example of mining, buying things, and miners themselves can move forward, but sometimes also mining companies set different specifications and they want boots of different qualities. And you can't have 10 different producing companies of boots because one wants 10 buttons and another one wants eight. So there are a few efforts that may seem small barriers, but they make a sense, they have a sense. And this is linked to what was asked about the relationship between the state and the private sector. That I believe is a topic that we need to work a bit more because the Korean experience and the general Asian experience has a role of the state, but also protagonism by the private company. What generates growth is because of these supports. They have these public financing schemes, and but many of these companies are private, and that's why we have had so much technological development and the articulation of all these parties creates positive outcomes. It is impressing how in the Chinese case, Alibaba started growing and the Chinese market controlled it. They basically said, no, you're going to be here. You're going to stay there. Don't move. You're going to obey me. It may be a bit dictatorial, but it is clear that there is a way to of the state uh, having or wanting to control. I think that most of our countries have this problem of oligarchy going into policy politics and changing the market. In China, for example, it's different. No, no, no. The state is the one that rules over here. We can support you. You can be a millionaire, whatever. But I set the rules. We should analyze those experiences. I think that that entails a reasoning in which the state understands and hears and listens, but maintains the direction. I think that that logic um, is different. In our country, we have a not because oligarchy and powerful groups go into the state, right? To set rents, to push their interests and they support candidates and they, they turn screws here and there. And about politics, I don't have a solution still. The fact that we have elections demands for ex exaggerated policy changes? No. And let's think of Japan, where there is no big changes in politics, for example. But in Chile, there is a small limit. And there are other experiences in Latin America, again, even in the US, after the war, fracking, Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the New Deal, but then we had Eisenhower and the policy didn't change. 
more or less, let's say, right? So there are countries that do accomplish a, a social state connection uh, to uphold the economic and political system. It's not frozen, but it does dominate for a longer period of time. Now, I don't have the current solution. I know that we have to think about this, but I don't have it. Now, so far, the last studies that I've seen recently about economic growth and democracy go nowhere. Democracy neither supports, I mean, it's not that so democracy support more than dictatorships, no. The variable is not fine enough, let's say. I do think that we need to take a long-term, medium-term look. For example, in import replacement strategies in Latin America, they had continuity in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with the election of the neoliberal as well, indeed. Yes. Of course. I, first of all, would, would say that changing government every year is difficult. But even in that case, I have a counterexample. Compare the United Kingdom with Italy in 1945 and the following 50 years. In 50 years, Italy had 50 governments. England had five. England had won the Second World War. Italy lost it. And now the GDP of Italy surpasses England's having had 50 governments. So there are, there may be many governments, but there is a bureaucratic layer of continuity, let's say. So the political change is, is rather uh, superficial and there is political permanence. On the other hand, it's maintained. How the political system is, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I can say that those of us who bet on economic development and production, we need to think about this. It's not our topic, but we need to in sync ourselves with that. 